classes in polymer dynamics based on George Philly's book Phenomenology of Polymer Solution Dynamics Cambridge University Press 2011 and today this lecture is lecture 27 course summary I'm Professor Phillies and this is the next in my series of lectures on the phenomenology of polymer solution dynamics all based on my book phenomenology of polymer solution dynamics Cambridge University Press 2011 today what we're going to do is to work through the next to the last chapter in the book the chapter where we go through every, all of the methods we've talked about and say something of a summary of what we learned from each technique. Uh, the basic issue was going way back to the start of the discussion well how do we, what, how do we accurately describe what polymers do in solution? What sort of functional forms fit our measurements? And I, in fact, noted two forms. One was for a transport parameter. It doesn't matter which one. And one can have a stretched exponential where there's a concentration dependence. And there is a dependence on the molecular weight of the um, matrix. And there is a, perhaps, if we have a probe which is separate, there is a dependence on the molecular weight of the probe and perhaps this object depends on the probe size that's not atypically the case and that is a stretched exponential form the other form we might have is a t proportional to some constant c to the minus x or if you prefer plus x m to the y a scaling law. So we have a stretched exponential form and the scaling law form um, and the question is what fits. Now these forms have one very important feature. If you take a log log plot log t versus log, whatever the independent variable is, and you have a scaling law, you get out a straight line. Or, if the slope is the other way, you get out the other straight line. On the other hand, if you have stretched exponential on a log-log curve, the stretched exponential gives you a smooth curve. Very characteristic feature, and the question is, is the second derivative log, d log t d log i is the second derivative going to be zero or is it going to be some number we have several cases in which in the same set of measurements you get both behaviors and therefore there is no, no reasonable doubt that you can actually tell these apart because in the cases when both are present you can easily see both of them and it is painfully obvious that you're seeing both of them. So that it was the general beginning point uh, as to what sort of concentration and molecular weight dependence you have. And there are actually cases where you see one or the other or both. <clears throat> okay, so let us go back chapter 2 The video which as I speak is not in the playlist because it didn't come out and therefore is going to have to be retaped someday. And we will start off by discussing sedimentation. That is, we take a polymer solution, we put it in the ultra centrifuge, we spin it up, and the polymer sediments out of solution. Now, there are actually three sets of experiments we can think of here. Uh, and the first is one species dilute solution. And that's the analytical application. The analytical application is very old indeed. 
This was in fact how people determined that proteins are not association colloids, they're macromolecules of well-defined molecular weights. One can also look at one species in a non-dilute solution, and one can ask how if you have a concentrated solution of polymer coils, how the solution, how the polymers sediment and do measurements. And then one can do a system in which there are two species of polymers or whatever. So there is the polymer that is the matrix. And there is the probe. We st this theme, dilute, non-dilute, probe system, is going to repeat a great deal. Uh, in some cases, but not others, it's critical that the probe species be dilute, um, in which case you are in fact observing single particle motion of the probe species through the um, perhaps non-dilute matrix polymer. Uh, one should be careful to realize that the probe may be very similar to the matrix. For example, we somehow reach in and most of the matrix polymers are invisible and we have tagged one matrix chain in the unseen background with a fluorescent dye. That's one of many methods of proceeding. And we watch a matrix polymer that is identical except for the tag to its neighbors. The other choice is, for example, we have our concentrated matrix chains, or perhaps not so concentrated, and we put in a probe species, which could even be a colloidal particle, that could be very different than the matrix. So there are actually two sorts of probes one can think of using. However, in both of these cases, one arranges things. The details of how depend on the technique. So you're looking at the motion of single probe particles or dilute probe particles so that probe-probe interactions don't count. You're looking at probe motions through a matrix of some sort. So that in general is what we do. <clears throat> and the question is what sort of experimental results we get out of sedimentation. The first answer is that if you start out with polymer and you increase its, um, the concentration of chains, the sedimentation coefficient falls. The second part is the larger the polymer is, the more rapidly it sediments. That is, the weight of the polymer, the buoyant mass actually, or in solution, increases linearly in the size of the polymer. The drag coefficient increases as m to the half or some similar such number. And the net result is that the larger polymers at low concentration sediment more slowly than the smaller polymers do. However, if you increase the, the concentration of polymer, one of several things happens. For polymers in good solution, good solvents, the um, curves S versus C roll over and more or less merge. <clears throat> That's in good solvents. In theta solvents, you see something a bit different. Namely, there's a rollover. There's the large chain. There's rollover here. And the curves don't appear to cross, but measurements aren't taken to sufficiently high concentration to quite be sure. On the other hand, if you do things in a ternary system and look at the, the sedimentation of a probe through a matrix, that one has been done. And if you look at the measurements, it's fairly clear that what you actually see is that at large concentration, the large uh, probe chains sediment more slowly than small probe chains do. OK. You can also look and compare. We're saying we're measuring S versus C. 
You can also measure the viscosity as a function of concentration. And then you can go in and say, OK, we know what the viscosity is. We know what the sedimentation coefficient is. And therefore, we can look at the product S eta, which you could imagine if you want, normalizing by their zero concentration limiting values. And if you do that, you get three, a couple of sorts of behaviors. You get systems in which the ratio stays at least quite close to one, and that's Stokes-Einstein, or at least Einstein, Stokes I mean, type behavior. You also get systems in which the ratio is very definitely not equal to 1 at large um, concentration. And that's non-Stokes behavior. And then you get systems in which there is a deviation over some range, one deviation or the other. And then things go back to the Stokes type behavior. And I describe this as a re entrance. Uh, re entrance is not quite as common as might be supposed. Now, you might worry well, gee, how can you get non Stokesian behavior? Isn't that really unreasonable? And the answer is or the front part of the answer, is that if you go back and look at Stokes' law, F, this is for spheres, it's being written for 6 pi viscosity of the solution R. Uh, Stokes' law is a continuum calculation, and it refers to a particle moving in a straight line at constant speed. Well. Most of these particles are not moving at a straight line in constant speed. Furthermore, we are talking about things that are not in a Newtonian solvent, a Newtonian solvent such as the one for which Stokes' law was derived. Already, if the particle is not simply moving at constant speed, Stokes' law should be replaced by the Bosonesque equation which describes non-steady motion of a particle through a Newtonian solution. A major issue in statistical mechanics, at least in the right branch of the field, 40 years ago, was if you, if you thought you should have Bosonesque equation drag, did you get the Stokes-Einstein diffusion result, which seemed to be accurate? And the answer is that the Bosonesque drag does lead to the Stokes-Einstein equation. However, the Bosonesque equation includes such things as a memory function. Uh, the behavior that the Bosonesque equation describes is already only for Newtonian solvents, and therefore the fact you have to do a bit better than Stokes' law should not really be at all surprising. OK. Uh, we now chug ahead, and we look, go to chapter 3. And we look at the other driven motion technique that is of large importance, which is electrophoresis. There are actually four, well, you could make a case for dielectric relaxation, five, driven motion techniques. There's sedimentation, which is by far the oldest in terms of polymers. Electrophoresis, the start end is at about the same date. Um, Tezelius was a student of the folks who developed the ultracentrifuge. Uh, there's electrophoresis. There are also several um, techniques, magnetic, magnetic fields, optical tweezers. There are several techniques where you can actually reach in and one way or the other, put a force on a colloidal probe and measure the diffusion motion, which is not diffusive, it's a driven of the colloid. And then you can put in a case 
that in fact, if you are talking about dielectric relaxation, the mode involves orienting the chain end-to-end -end vector, and in a certain sense there's driven motion, but you're changing the direction things face, you're not causing it to move sideways. But let, so let us consider electrophoresis. And the first thing we find, general notion, we're talking about a specific sort of electrophoresis. The technique is called capillary zone electrophoresis. The point of capillary zone electrophoresis is that you take a very long, extremely narrow tube. You insert into it a plug, which can actually, a, a plug of material containing probes. The polymer solution is already everywhere along the tube, and more is available to be fed in from a reservoir as need be. You apply an electric field one way or the other, and the probes move down the tube. The details of all of the forces on the probe moving down the tube are actually extremely complicated. And writing the naive F equals QE tends to miss the point. Break while I close the door. As the objects move, they move at different speeds. And so they sort out. You look at the far end, you detect their arrival. That gives you a time and a speed, and therefore an average drift velocity. Uh, the drift velocity leads to the electrophoretic mobility mu. Okay, having said we are going to the electrophoretic mobility mu, what behaviors does mu exhibit? First, if you look at the concentration dependence to good approximation, you see a stretched exponential concentration dependence. As the concentration goes up, the of polymer goes up, the um, behavior goes down. And if we do a plot of mu against C, log log plot, you see a smooth curve like this. People have measured the so-called overlap concentration, C star in these systems, and you observe single curves that are, the, that are very much the same in parameters below C star and above C star. There's no direct evidence in the measurement that you have different physical mechanisms retarding polymer motion at lower and higher concentrations. Now you can find in the literature some very nice, well-reasoned papers which come to the inverse conclusion. And the inverse conclusion is based on the following logic. We have a technique uh, and an uh, in, uh, interaction that we believe would act to slow polymers down, but in this effect, entanglement effects, are only effective at C greater than C star. In fact, there are some entanglement type models that sort of claim that below C star, the concentration dependence should be close to zero. We, however, see that even very low concentrations of polymer are effective at slowing down our probe particles. And therefore, we need, because this mechanism stops at C star plus times a constant perhaps, we need another mechanism, a different mechanism, that is effective down here. That reasoning is based on the assertion that you know what the mechanism is up here, and you know it stops at this point. However, as shows up in, repeatedly in the literature, and may, we'll get to this in the next few lectures, in fact, you see a smooth continuous curve with no sign of a discontinuity 
and therefore the inverse argument is a bit more appropriate, namely you see one curve, therefore there is no evidence for two mechanisms. Uh, in fact, if you want to say there are two mechanisms, you somewhat have to explain why as you cross from here to there, not only is the sedimentation coefficient itself continuous, that's only reasonable, but the slope is continuous. Slope is continuous says something considerably more profound. Now, there is actually a huge body of electrophoresis literature. Very little of it has been analyzed from the standpoint of understanding polymer solution dynamics. Historically, people did electrophoresis to determine the property of the migrating charge species, for example, their molecular weight. I am offering here exactly the contrary perspective, a complementary perspective, not a contradictory one, namely that we have these moving charged probes and we can use them to study the properties of the polymer support medium. Okay, so that's the concentration dependence. We can also look at the probe de size dependence. And if we do that for smaller probes, we see a stretched exponential behavior in probe size. And then there is a quite sharp, not necessarily perfectly sharp transition. And for larger probe sizes, we see a weak power law dependence on probe size. This on the scale of the figure is very clearly a straight line, not a smooth curve. It fits well a power law. And there is a sharp discontinuity here. And therefore, in a case where we have stretched exponential behavior and we have power law behavior, we can clearly see both of them separate. Uh, you might reasonably ask what this transition is. That has not really been worked out. Uh, one answer, however, is, appears to be suggested by the fact that the location of this transition depends on polymer concentration, depends on polymer molecular weight, and at least loosely speaking, appears to um, be the region in which we move from a transport coefficient that's independent <coughs> of the applied field to a transport coefficient that depends on the applied field. That is, we are moving from a linear response regime to a nonlinear response regime. There is one more thing you can do with electrophoresis. You can do video measurements. And if you do the video measurements on large DNAs, you find that large DNAs take up configurations like J, W, V, and you can actually see the chains spread out as they move. If you do the experiment with star polymers, you see something that I am not drawing extremely accurately, but it looks sort of like a squid. The arms are spread out in front like my fingers, and the squid moves along like this. It's a squid-like motion, but the good Latin name is, of course, Teuthidic. From the Teuthidae, the squids. Uh, if you actually do this and ask, well, what happens when the star polymer hits a gel, that is a cross-linked gel. Here's the cross-linked gel. And the answer is the star polymer floats nicely through solutions, hits the gel, and crashes to a stop on the surface. It can't penetrate because the holes aren't big enough. Teuthidic motion, well, if you think you are in the linear response regime, then the fluctuation dissipation theorem and linear response theory says this is also the con configuration, except not so exaggerated, that the polymer uses to diffuse. This configuration of diffusion, where by inference the matrix chains are being dragged along as the probe moves, is not the same as the arrangement supposed in some polymer solution dynamics models. Oh yes. Augston Seedman. Augston was a very clever fellow. 
who did a bunch of theoretical calculations on how objects would move through cross-linked, mechanically cross-linked immobile gels. And what he predicted as applied to electrophoresis is that mu is some exponential minus and then his theory predicts the powers. It predicts concentration to the first power, r to the second power, molecular weight to the zero power. You will find in the electrophoretic literature's reference to we are in the sieving regime, and that refers to the observation that they are seeing e to the minus concentration to the first, the other dependences being ignored. Well, you can measure the other dependences, though you'd have to view this as an interesting topic. And if you do that, you discover that r square is way off. The actual power is less than 1, typically. And m to the 0 is extremely wrong. The power is considerably greater than 0. There is a molecular weight dependence. And therefore, while the concentration dependence is what is being said to be, well, more or less, anyhow. Um, the predictions for the radius and matrix molecular weight dependences are not consistent with experiment. So it doesn't appear that you don't really get oxygen sieving in the solution. We now reach chapter 4. Chapter 4 talks about quasi-elastic light scattering spectroscopy, which I spent 40 years doing research with. Uh, quasi or close to 40 years, anyhow. Quasi-elastic light scattering spectroscopy um, is a standard scattering technique. The main issue in the chapter, it's not a full explanation of the method, even though it is our only methods chapter, was to discuss a few issues which are sometimes represented incorrectly in the literature. Uh, one of the more important ones is that you will find people who say that the decay spectrum corresponds to particle motions as e to the minus q square. q is the scattering vector. x square is the mean square particle displacement. That equation is fine if you are looking at monodispersed particles non-interacting in a simple Newtonian fluid. It's already wrong if the probe particles are bidisperse. How can you tell if this spectrum is right, if this form is right? If this claim is correct, the relaxation spectrum is a mono-exponential decay. If the spectrum is not e to the minus constant t, then this form is wrong. Uh, that's actually a very important issue in some contexts. <coughs> Chapter 5, we actually reach measurements on how things move through solution. And so we're going to look first of small molecule motions. Now, we didn't have to start here, and if you look at review articles, a lot of review articles will start with polymer self-diffusion, the whole chain moving. Uh, I decided to do things in order of increasing size. Uh, there is no completely satisfactory arrangement. And I decided, well, first, let's look at how small particles move through liquids that are viscous because, oh, there's sugar solutions or there's something similar. And this goes back to results of, for example, Heber Green 100 years ago. And if we plot different people have measured the diffusion coefficient or the conductivity, that's an electrophoresis experiment, but it's done on ions, versus viscosity of the liquid, you find an eta to the first region, which extends out to something like five centipoids. I want to emphasize there's nothing magic about five centipoids. However, the viscosity of a typical liquid that's a nice solvent is about one centipoise. And someplace up here is three and a half to five centipoise, someplace in there. 
there is actually a fairly sharp transition, and above that constant, that viscosity, we have, I guess it should be a to the minus one for diffusion coefficient, we have an eta to the minus two thirds behavior. That is, the dependence of the diffusion coefficient or conductivity on viscosity only shows Stokes-Einstein behavior up to a point. Question? Uh, just for reference, water's uh, viscosity is one centimeter. Correct. 0.89 at close to room temperature. Yeah, about one. Well, let me, let me put in a comment on that. It's one at room temperature. Right. Between that you, it's just melted ice and it's about to boil, there's something like a factor of five change in viscosity. That's a big change in viscosity, but if you ask yourself, have you ever noticed that boiling water sloshes a bit more in the pan than ice water? If you look for it, you can actually see it, but you may never have noticed it. That's just, we aren't very sensitive to viscosities. Uh, if you replace this with, um, these are ions and small molecules. If you replace this with polystyrene latex spheres, whose diameter might be O, 200 angstroms or bigger. What you find is that D is proportional to T over eta of the solution. And that is quite accurate over O oh, three orders of magnitude change in viscosity. That is, this is a small probe effect. The mesoscopic probe behavior is very different. There is a long literature of people duplicating this experiment uh, in part because someone got, once got a different result. I can't explain that. Okay, How, now we come to polymers. After all, if you want to make a, a liquid viscous, one thing you can do is to add something like mannitol. That's a sugar. Works. Your other choice is to add polymer. And if you measure the diffusion coefficient of solvent as a function of polymer concentration well you do have the limit that eventually you get up to the melt and everything stops but before that you have this somewhat interesting effect namely you have an e to the minus a phi to the first you have a pure exponential up to a point and above the point you have a stretched exponential there is a smooth transition between them. Uh, there is a zone in which both curves describe the measurements to within the limits of accuracy of the experiment because, you know, it's a tangent. And close to the tangent, the two curves are very close together. Um, you can sort of ask a sensible question like, why is this happening? And in fact, I, though it's not in the book, I've developed that since then. A reasonable explanation for this transition, which occurs at a volume fraction something around 0.4 or 0.35 or 0.5, someplace in there, is that you have polymers in solution. These are cross sections of polymer chains. And at some point, typical solvent molecule, this is a polymer cross section, they can be narrow in cross section, they're long this way. The solvent molecule gets small enough that you can't treat the, the solvent in the space between polymer chains as a continuum anymore because the solvent molecules are too big. And that's roughly where this crossover occurs. Um, the last thing you can do, which is of some interest, is to say, well, we can go in and we can measure the viscosity of the liquid doing oscillatory shear and we can try to get up to infinite frequency. Well, you can't really get up to infinity, but you don't have to get that far. And the idea of getting up to infinite frequency is that at infinite frequency the polymer doesn't move very much and therefore you just should see the solvent viscosity. And that doesn't quite hold up as well as you might expect. Instead, eta, that omega goes to infinity, goes as e to the minus of some concentrate, the cons polymer concentration, and some constant 
and therefore the high frequency viscosity does not behave quite the way people thought it might. Hey, that's small molecule motions. Oh, there's one other bit on small molecule motions I'll drop in. I've been describing you add polymer and things slow down. There are a few systems, and there are very nice experiments due to Amilar and Lodge and a string of other names, which show a few systems in which you add polymer, and when you add polymer, the polymer plasticizes the very viscous solvent, and the solvent molecules move faster. And since you have some polymers that slow things down, and others that speed it up, you can create polymers that are mixtures of two types of backbone. And if you are clever in how you do this, the very clever experiment is due to Cron and Lodge. They eventually work out, looking at how the solvent moves, that the range of the effect of the polymer molecule on the solvent is, oh, a couple of solvent diameters. It's a somewhat, it's a very clever but somewhat indirect experiment which shows that yes, the polymer does change the solvent properties and if we're at very high concentration, more or less all of the polymer must have had its properties changed, mustn't it? Okay. Having said that, <coughs> we push ahead. <coughs> And we talk about segmental motion. And we also talk in the following chapter about dielectric relaxation. The segmental discussion, there are a variety of, of ways of measuring how rapidly a segment moves. For example, you can take a polymer and stick into its middle a rigid piece and the rigid piece has an optically active dipole or matrix element and you can then ask how rapidly the uh, central piece reorients. You can do the same experiment without ma chemical manipulation using NMR. And what you find is that if the polymer is at all large the orientation times you see for, or most of the relaxation, go as m to the zero. If you make the polymer small enough, this is no longer true. And you can sort of infer, that therefore, here's a chain end, and it's free to flop around. And therefore, the things along here find it easier to reorient than something in the middle does. And the range of this effect in terms of how far in you can tell you're near an end is something like 5 or maybe 10 kilodalton of chain. And if you're further in than that, you can't tell that the chain isn't infinitely long for the most part. So there are a range of local motions. Dielectric relaxation. Here's polymer coils. We can arrange things with organic chemistry so that the polymer coil incorporates a fixed dipole, that is, it's something dipole created by the chemical bonding. And the dipole has a component that lies parallel to the polymer chain axis. If you add all these vectors up and the whole chain is involved in those dipoles, the sum of all these dipoles is a vector that points from one end of the chain to the other end of the chain. It's point, it follows the end to end vector. You can now put the stuff into solution. You can measure the dielectric constant. You can measure the dielectric response as a function of frequency. And you can pull out a whole bunch of quantities. You can pull out the mean square end to end vector. You can pull out a characteristic relaxation time tau. That is, there's sort of a single character, not exactly, a single characteristic time, and you can determine what it is. You can also look at dielectric loss as a function of frequency. 
and you see a curve that has several modes that you can sort out. And then you can do some clever organic chemistry. And you can say, I will reach in, and this piece of the chain is, is dielectrically active, and this piece of the chain is some different organic chemical that has no dipole moment. And now I can use dielectric relaxation to look at the motion of part of the chain relative to the rest of the chain. So dielectric relaxation is an enormously effective tool. And what we demonstrate, important result, is that the relaxation time tau has a form. It, it has a, a stretched exponential concentration dependence. Well, not exactly. The tau increases as we increase the polymer concentration. And the dependence is c to the first r squared to a power I call psi. And psi is about 3 halves. That is, the concentration dependence is the concentration times the solution volume of the polymer chain. And the agreement is extremely good out to high concentration. The deviation of the concentration dependence of tau from a single exponential is described to great accuracy by the concentration dependence of the mean square radius. That actually works quite accurately. Okay, we have now talked about parts of chains. Having talked about parts of chains, we will now talk about full chain motions. In particular, we will start by talking about d sub s, the self or tracer diffusion coefficient. d sub s has been very extensively measured experimentally. It has been very extensively measured experimentally because it is a core quantity in several theories of polymer dynamics. And if we plot d sub s, this is a log-log plot against logarithm of concentration, what we fairly uniformly find is once again a stretched exponential. And the form of the stretched exponential is exponential minus a concentration to some power molecular weight of the matrix to some power, molecular weight of the probe to some other power, and the constant out here, I'll call B0, this is the, if it's the probe, presumably goes as P to the minus A, and you can actually see that in measurements. And there is very clearly and uniformly a stretched exponential concentration dependence. You can also write this as e to the minus alpha c to the nu, where these dependences have gotten buried with alpha. So you can actually see this form, and quite clearly, there is stretched exponential through all concentrations. There are almost no systems, I, I can think of one counterexample, in which you see a power law behavior that actually extends over any distance. There, there is one well-known early set of measurements which do show a power law behavior. However, if you look at the measurements, they also show that the diffusion coefficient increases with increasing matrix concentration before it goes down again. And since the number of points involved in this is quite small, my inclination is to say that the experimenters, who after all knew what they were looking for, had somewhat bad luck with instrumental noise. I don't see any sign that they did the experiment wrong. It's just that no other ex experimental curve on the same polymer in the same solvent shows the same behavior. <clears throat> well, having said that, what are the constants involved? If we look at alpha, alpha is proportional to a power of m and the power of M is someplace in the range 0.8 to 1, 
and that depends a bit on the system. And um, no, I'm sorry, that's the wrong numbers. I apologize. 0.5 to 0.75. You can also measure gamma and delta separately, and there's a bit of an issue here because gamma and delta, when added together, should equal that. But in fact, gamma and delta are each 0.25 to 0.3. They're a bit small to explain the complete molecular weight dependence. Now, these experiments are done on different systems. You're measuring the exponent of an exponent, which is not the world's most accurate measurement. And uh, therefore, it's not quite clear that there is a, an enormous challenge here, but you should be aware there's a bit of a discrepancy. You can also ask what the behavior of nu is. If you plot nu versus polymer molecular weight, of course, to measure nu, you have to measure ds at each polymer molecular weight for a lot of concentrations. And if you want to see what, how nu depends on polymer molecular weight, you must repeat this for a bunch of polymers of different sizes. It's a fair amount of work. And what you find is that at small molecular weight, nu is somewhat scattered, but someplace in the range downwards from m. And then if you get above about 250 kilodalton, nu is someplace close to a half. And I am being a bit, it's close to a half. And that is what you actually find experimentally. Now, there are two specific experiments which do not show this behavior. I'm going to reference both of them. They're both very nice experiments. And they, the, one of them talks about experimental data way out here in concentration. And the other um, is a single point, but we'll see what it is. And the first set of experiments about are due to Tau et al. And Tau et al. talk about, in the Lodge group, looked at a polymer, high molecular weight, and they took the polymer out to the melt and measured the self-diffusion coefficient all the way out to the melt. And then they tried to come downwards from the melt towards the solution, but they didn't come way down. They came down to volume fractions of 0.2 or so and higher. And what they very clearly found was E proportional to O volume fraction to the minus, I seem to recall, 1.8 molecular weight to the minus O about 2.4 to good approximation. That is, they actually found po clear power law behavior. And in these systems, which are taken out to the melt itself, much higher concentrations than the other stuff I was talking about, you very clearly do see power law behavior. There is also an experiment of Nomoto Unfortunately, this was done at fixed concentration, but you know, it's a lot of work to do these things. And what is found as a function of molecular weight is that you have a stretched exponential regime, and you then have a quite sharp crossover to what is clearly a power law regime. And Right, there are several issues here. First of all, you really do see a power law and a crossover to a power law. Second, you very clearly can see both in the, set of, in the same set of measurements. And since you can see both in the same set of measurements, there's no doubt that the fitting pro process that gets us to this point can actually see power laws when they are present. And that is it for polymer self-diffusion. And with that, we advance to probe diffusion.
The literature on probe diffusion is enormous. We're talking about something that is not the same as self and tracer diffusion. We are talking about experiments in which we have a polymer in solution. And we insert a colloidal probe and we can measure the translation or in some cases the rotation of the probe. And the question is, what do we observe experimentally? And the answer is that the probe diffusion coefficient, the probe, follows a stretched exponential e to the minus alpha c to the mu e concentration. In cases in which you have done measurements on a substantial number of different polymers, molecular weights, same chemical substance, same probe, you can actually talk about how alpha depends on m or how nu depends on polymer molecular weight. And what you find is that alpha, this is measurements on probes with dextran, goes as m to the 0.84 in the case that's in the book. And nu falls with increasing polymer molecular weight. Now you may remember for tracer diffusion coefficients, I, or self diffusion coefficients, I said that nu plateaued when it got to 0.5. In the probe data, there's a lot of probe data that doesn't quite get that far. However, that is the probe diffusion measurement. Um, the other thing you can do, which is how a fair number of people actually got interested in this, is you can measure the diffusion coefficient of the probe and you can measure the low shear viscosity as a function of concentration. And you can report this as just the product, perhaps normalized, or you can report, use this to compute the current hydrodynamic radius of the probe, or you can say, I know how big the probe is, I can calculate a microscopic viscosity. And this has been around for a very long time. Uh, the first experiments were due to Hallett and Turner and Hallett and Gray. And if you do those experiments, uh, what you find is that the probe diffusion coefficient, even for very large probes, is very definitely not determined by the solution viscosity. Uh, this ratio easily can increase by three orders of magnitude as you go to large solution viscosity. Uh, claims that for big probes we have to see the viscosity of the solution are simply experimentally false. There have also been experiments done in which, in addition to looking at probes and gels, you can go into the probe and the gel and you can start inserting crosslinks, and you can take the probe in solvent and convert it to a probe in a gel. And if you do that, what you find is that probe diffusion in gels is totally different from probe diffusion in solution. In solution, you have probes, and these are weak size filters. That is, the ability of the polymer solution to slow down the probe depends on how big the probe is so that d over d0 depends on probe size. But it's not a very strong dependence. It's a dependence you can see. It's a dependence that the electrophoresis community uses to sort polymers out. But it's not a big dependence. On the other hand, cross-linked gels are strict size filters there is a largest size above which probe particles are simply trapped in gels and only can move back and forth within small cages and just can't get any further and therefore uh, polymer solutions are very much not like gels um, on the time scales in which the probe moves fairly small distances through the gel. Okay. That's probe diffusion. <laughs>
uh, minor aside, there are actually two probe diffusion literatures. There is a probe diffusion literature that's been around since 74 or 76, uh, in which one, the technique is often called optical probe diffusion. You're interested in the diffusion coefficient with no pretense that you're getting information out on the viscosity of the solution. There is a separate technique, same physical methods, called microreology, in which various claims are made that you can use the probe to determine the local viscosity. Uh, those claims do not appear, in my personal opinion, to be well supported. In some cases, they're supported by experiments where the analysis is clearly fundamentally wrong. Uh, in some cases, um, there is a comparison made with the macroscopic viscosity, and there are differences of factors of two or three, which are somewhat brushed off. Well, non-Stokes Einsteinian behavior can be a factor of 10 cubed, but a more typical number is two or three, and therefore the non-Stokes Einsteinian behavior that the probe diffusion literature has been studying for 30 years is being treated as more or less negligible by the so-called microreology communities. Uh, now you might wonder, well, why isn't this contradiction resolved in the literature? And the answer is solved by citation analysis. That is, you can find the two literatures, which are not completely contemporaneous, and the more recent, mostly microreology literature proceeds as if the optical probe diffusion literature is not there. Um, <clears throat> Well, having said that, we are going to push ahead to another chapter. In the next chapter, we are going to advance to discuss is colloids. If you go way back to the introduction, I have listed a whole series of different very good review articles on polymer dynamics. Review articles written prior to mine. And you will find they center on measurements of low shear viscosity, measurements of self-diffusion, perhaps measurements of viscoelasticity. I could go on for a bit, but you may get the general idea. And having said, there are all of these methods that um, are, they discuss, they sort of stop there. You don't see sedimentation or electrophoresis or dielectric relaxation or you may see segmental motions discussed. And now we come to a topic that's completely not there at all, colloid dynamics. Why would colloid dynamics be interesting, interested in, in a discussion of polymer solution dynamics? After all, here's a polymer coil. Here's a colloidal sphere. It's rigid. It has no internal motions. Why are we interested in its behavior? The answer is that the forces between colloids in solution and the forces between polymer coils in solution, with one exception, are the same. That is, we have hydrodynamic interactions, which arise because the solvent has some properties. We also have excluded volume interactions, and I mean that in the literal sense, colloids or polymer chains cannot simply move through each other. Notice I did not say what happens when they try, because there are two obvious answers. And one answer is, one moves up to the other and is brought to a stop because the other is in the way. And the other answer is one moves up, the two move on in concert. Those are both answers. Uh, there are a number of mo theoretical models that are based on making the assumption that one is, or the other is correct. However, there is one fundamental difference. You can take two polymer chains and tie them in knots. <laughs> 
And as long as they are tied in knots and you don't untangle the knot, which may take a while, the polymer coils are constrained to move together. Well, spheres can get in each other's way, and there is a phenomenon known as jamming, which occurs at very high sphere concentrations. Uh, however, you cannot tie two spheres in knots around each other. They're rigid, round objects. They're like mar toy marbles. You cannot make knots out of them. And therefore, the two systems differ in their topology. And because they differ in their topology, uh, G, if you're interested in sorting out what hydrodynamics and excluded volume do from what topology does, this is a very natural comparison to make. Oh, some people would point out there's one other difference. Here's a polymer coil. It has a characteristic radius, which can be drawn in different ways. However, if another polymer coil comes up to it, because this polymer is basically empty space with a little coil mixed in, the dist minimum distance the two polymer centers chain centers can get from each other is very small relative to the radius. For spheres, the distance of minimum approach is the distance of minimum approach. And if I say this sphere and this chain are about the same size, these two spheres can never get closer than this, but these two chains can get very close together indeed. Fundamental difference and colloid dynamics gives us, therefore, direct access to looking at topological effects. And so what I do is to enumerate all of the measurements that have been done on colloid behavior. And what we find, if you look at those, is G. Um, Many of the behaviors of colloids and of polymers are very similar. In particular, if you plot either the self-diffusion coefficient or the mutual diffusion coefficient, pair diffusion coefficient, against concentration, you find there are lead initial slopes. And the lead initial slopes, um, you can calculate for spheres. And the calculations work. Now, the calculations are somewhat sensitive to the form of the hydrodynamic interaction at short distance, which you can calculate, and therefore to the potential energy at short distance, which is hard to control. So these are actually difficult experiments to do to extremely high precision. But particularly for the self-diffusion coefficient, You can actually do the calculation and you get very good agreement between experiment and theory. And therefore, when we say the interactions between spheres are hydrodynamic and hard sphere, not only is this obvious by inspection, but the theory makes a series of predictions for the concentration dependence of the self-diffusion coefficient, the mutual diffusion coefficient, uh, the uh, rotational diffusion coefficient, because you can put something inside a sphere and then measure how fast it reorients diffusively. And you can actually measure these in the theory works. There are some differences between spheres and uh, polymer coils. Uh, one of them is that if I plot viscosity versus concentration, the viscosity of spheres comes up and quite Consistently, we see a solution-like, melt-like transition. However, in polymers, the transition is simply analytic, and you, you, the two curves are stretched exponential and power law, have the same slope at the intersection. For spheres, there's a transition, and it does not appear that the first derivative is continuous. Something turns on at a, a particular concentration in a very visible um, you can also look at the um, dynamic moduli G prime and G double prime of sphere systems. 
and you can look at these versus frequency. Of course, as we point out with chronic Cromer's relations, there's the same information in the two of these. So saying we can look at both of them tells you things, but it doesn't necessarily tell you quite as much as you might have thought. And what you see is a, an early stretched exponential regime in frequency, and then a power law in frequency, and it looks very much like polymer coils. Except there's no possibility at all that the, the spheres are tying each other in knots. Uh, an amusing extreme form of this, there are a set of experiments in which you can make a heavily cross-linked, or cross-linked anyhow, polymer, and it's a sphere. But if you heat the spheres up, they don't stick to each other very firmly, and you can make a liquid out of these, even though they're quite large. And you can look at the dynamic moduli versus frequency, and these spheres look exactly like so-called entangled, entangled polymer coils. <clears throat> That's colloids. <clears throat> we'll now actually talk about quasi-elastic light scattering spectroscopy measurements on potentially concentrated polymer solutions. I say potentially concentrated because most experimenters they're going to look at the concentrated regime, also cover the, di the less concentrated down to low, very low concentration regime. This part, after all, is much less work than this part. Uh, there are a few sets of data that fail to do so. And the first thing you can do is to say that the scattering spectrum is e to minus some gamma. It's sometimes also written capital omega t. That notation is not the same as the standard modern notation, but we're looking back many years. And we can ask how omega, the, the first cumulant, depends on the concentration of polymer and how it depends on the scattering vector. There are a variety of theoretical models that do this at various levels of approximation, starting with work of Pecora. And if you put all of these together, you discover that the fairly low concentration, potentially large, even large Q regime is fairly well understood based on a purely hydrodynamic calculation. You can then, however, push ahead and you can say, um, suppose we look at single chains in a matrix background and we look at very large Q and we can plot gamma, we look at all Q, and at smaller Q you see Q square behavior, and at larger Q, for in what should be a very concentrated, like 40 weight percent matrix polymer concentration, you see up here Q cube behavior, what is known as Zim behavior, the alternative to Zim behavior is Rouse behavior, and Rouse behavior is Q to the 4. The difference between Zim and Rouse behavior is that in the Zim model, you have hydrodynamic interactions between the polymers. And in the Rouse model, there are no hydrodynamic interactions. It's an early and very clever approximation. Well, you see Zim behavior you see hydrodynamic interaction, what appear to be hydrodynamic interactions between the parts of very large 40 megadalton polymer coils in an entangled matrix. And therefore, you do not appear to have what is the so-called hydrodynamic screening phenomenon by direct experimental measurement. OK, that's part two. Part three, polymer slow mode. And so I will plot log S versus T. This is the light scattering spectrum. It's done in time domain rather than frequency domain because you can do things digitally more conveniently in time domain. And you see a, an exponential, or more or less exponential, 
And then, in at least some systems, you very clearly see a second, or in some cases, third. This shape can be more complicated than an exponential. Very long-lived mode. And the question is, what is the very long-lived mode? This was an extremely controversial topic. The first reason it's controversial is that all systems do not show it. In some cases, what appear to be the same polymer sample from the same supplier in the same organic solvent, which you hope has been adequately purified in both cases, and they were both good people, one lab sees it and one doesn't. And it is not at all clear in some cases why different people do not get the same results. We can say it's not due to dust, because some labs can find systems that show it and, and systems that don't, and they're using the same experimental protocol. We can say it's not polydispersity, because someone lined up a whole bunch of polymers with different molecular weight distributions and showed that some systems, monodispersed systems, show it, and some systems polydispersed systems don't. And if you mix the monodispersed systems, they continue to show it. And this goes on, and, and to a certain extent, it was never completely satisfactory. However, a beautiful series of experiments due to SEDLAC on polyelectrolytes appear to have shown what the uh, slow mode is. At least he showed something that has the properties of the slow mode in what appears to be a consistent way. Oh, one of those properties is, suppose you take a system that shows the slow mode and you pass it through a nanoporous filter. The slow mode disappears. And, now, and that rules out any interpretation as this being an extra hydrodynamic mode uh, like a rayleigh brillon spectrum mode, because you can't filter out the Rayleigh spectrum solvent from the Brillouin spectrum solvent. It just doesn't happen. But if you sit around for a while, it comes back. And what Sedlak demonstrated, long series of experiments I've discussed before, is that you are fairly looking at an equilibrium structure and you can approach the equilibrium structure either from too much of it or none of it. And if you wait long enough, years, or one or two years anyhow, the structure comes to about the same amount in solution. And you seem to be looking at vitrified regions, regions within which the polymer moves slowly. And the interpretation I advance for this is that you are looking at a Kibbelson model glass. That is, you are looking at regions in which the, chain, the density of chains does not have to be different. We, I, in my lab I actually did an experiment. You go through from low concentration, no slow mode, to high concentration, the slow mode appears. And the intensity, the normalized by concentration, does not change when the slow mode appears. That's not your forming aggregates. You're forming regions within which chains cannot move fast. OK, that's it for light scattering spectroscopy. We now come to viscosity and viscoelasticity. Uh, first, viscosity. And we do a measurement of viscosity versus concentration. And what we discover, this, and I'm about to make a point that is not in the book, because the result is there, and I point out the phenomenon, but I do not attach the capstone name to it. What we see phenomenologically in some cases going out to the melt is that in some systems, eta has a stretched exponential dependence on polymer concentration. And in other systems, we see first a stretched exponential and then a power law dependence 
we see a solution-like, melt-like transition. We also have systems that stay solution-like. And we, I go through a large chunk of the literature, and you can see some of these and some of these. Now, if you ask, where does the solution-like, melt-like transition occur? The characteristic feature as to where it occurs appears to be best expressed as viscosity over solvent viscosity is oh, a couple times 10 squared, 100, 200, 300. You could also ask, well, gee, does the transition occur at a characteristic concentration, concentration times intrinsic viscosity, or concentration over C star? And the answer here is no. You can find transitions for C eta as low as 4, or 35, or 80. Uh, in so-called natural concentration units, the transition occurs all over the place. However, in terms of relative viscosity, this is the relative viscosity relative to the solvent, the transition occurs at about the same point. And now the point I missed in my book. The fact that you have these two curves says that the viscosity is not described by a universal form, a universal concentration dependence. And any theoretical model that says eta versus concentration, where you may have to put the concentration in natural units rather than grams per liter, any theory that says that viscosity does satisfy a universal form is wrong, because the viscosity doesn't do that. That is actually a major result, because there are some very standard theories that make the claim that viscosity has a universal functional dependence on concentration, namely out here there is always a scaling law. Well, you can find systems where there is a scaling law, but there are others where there isn't, and therefore the claim that viscosity is a universal function of concentration is mistaken. Uh, Oh, I said stretched exponential, didn't I? e to the alpha, c to the mu. Alpha is proportional to polymer molecular weight to some power around two-thirds. Nu, again, shows it starts off somewhere near one, but with a lot of scatter, and ends up near one-half with much less scatter for high molecular weight systems. That's viscosity. And we finally reach, and I'm almost but not quite out of time, the mystery of viscoelasticity. If you go back a quarter of a century and ask what is the concentration dependence of the visco elastic parameters. Well, first of all, they had lots of measurements because it was something that could be measured a long time ago. And second, they had good measurements. They had measurements as functions of concentration, as functions of polymer molecular weight. And what they said was, what the reviews will say is, that the behavior of the viscoelastic functions as you dilute the melt with solvent is mysterious. You can't create what were called superposition plots because the shapes of the functions change as you go to, as you dilute the system. And what I did was to introduce the temporal scaling zots, which predicts a frequency dependence. Of course, I sort of knew where I was going, let's be honest. But it does predict a frequency dependence, and that is the frequency dependence you actually find. And if we look at G prime of omega, or G double prime of omega, or if we look at the viscosity, the shear thinning, as a function of shear rate, what you find is that at lower frequencies, 
there is frequency. Well, first of all, if you want to do this, you have to normalize these. That was not done before. And the way, reason you normalize these is that if you're looking at a material parameter, you expect that at low frequency, the parameter should become frequency independent. And these things, in fact, go as omega square or omega to the first at low frequency. So we divide out this object that is clearly not part of the material parameter based on usual behavior of material parameters. And we find a low frequency exponential or step stretched exponential. We find a transition, there goes the stretched exponential, to a power law. At very large frequencies, well, you expect to see the salt of viscosity, and some people get down there. And in some systems, you see an additive slow mode, which may be another stretched exponential and power law, or it may seem to be just an exponential. And you see this complicated shape, which we can fit with extremely high precision. And I should emphasize we go over many orders of magnitude in response, and we go over even more orders of magnitude in frequency, and there's some tricks for doing this. And when you do that, the model predicts these forms with extreme precision, to, as far as I can tell, to within the precision of the measurements, over the full range of frequencies. And that is the temporal scaling ensembles. We can also show that if you describe these curves with the temporal scaling ensembles, and you apply what are known as the chronic Cromer's relations, which you reasonably know must be true for the original data. Well, if you use not the original data, but the fitted forms, you get good agreement with the chronic Cromer's relations. Okay. So we sort of push ahead and we look at this, and the, then there's the last thing we do. The stretched exponential goes as g i zero e to the minus alpha omega to some power. And if we compare alpha, oh, it also works for shear thinning. If we um, compare alpha with omega, or if we say that the shear thinning goes as e to the minus a to zero e to the minus alpha kappa to some power, which is typically often close to one. What we discover is that alpha is proportional to g or a to zero to about the two thirds power to very good precision, particularly for shear thinning. The relationship is extremely accurate. And therefore, this parameter out here, which de describes a frequency dependence, is being determined by the low frequency transport parameter, which in turn has the concentration dependence we've already discussed. Okay, now we get to viscoelasticity. And my comment on viscoelasticity is that Professor Wong sent me another of his wonderful preprints, and it consists of a whole bunch of experimental measurements and analyses, one of which points out that shear banding, which is something I discussed last time, actually appears to be a metastable outcome, not a stable outcome. How do we know this? Well, suppose we take the same polymer solution and we turn it up to some high shear rate. We can imagine doing this by turning on the shear, rotating the cone or the plate, and then leave it staying at high shear continuously. Or we can imagine ramping up very gently from low shear. Yes? We end up at the same point. Well, if you do the sharp ramp up and sit there, you see shear banding. If you do the slow ramp up, you do not see shear banding. Um, this result was probably in a few of his earlier preprints that were too early for my discussion, too late for my discussion in the book. And I'm simply going to say that therefore major aspects of this topic are still an active subject of research. Things have not settled down yet.
and therefore I'm not going to summarize them because I don't yet know what the summary is. We are out of time. That is the end of today's lecture. The next couple of lectures will bring us to conclusions to be drawn from all of these measurements. I've hinted at some of them already. And a theoretical model that actually explains the system as opposed to theoretical models which only explain hypothetical phenomenology not seen in nature. And with that, we are done.